I've always been in Liverpool. I've spent 85 and a half years living in Liverpool 9. Same, I've had different addresses in the same area, but they've all been in Liverpool 9. I was born in number three, Gladstone Road, which was my grandma's house, my dad's mum. And um, when my dad and mum got married, they went to live with my grandma, and that's where I was born. On the 19th of May, 1931, I had two wonderful parents, lovely grandparents, and uh, everybody was nice. Yes, I, I, I had a wonderful life. I loved every minute of it. My dad worked in the metal box. He, uh, it was only a storekeeper job or in the factory. It wasn't a highly paid job or anything. You worked hard, but you didn't earn a lot of money. And of course, when I was little, my mum didn't work at all. But we got along. My mum used to buy us sweets around at the local shop, and uh, we didn't go without things. We moved to Herbert Street, number 31, and I was there till I was almost 10, when we were bombed out in the May Blitz of 1941. So most of the house was destroyed. My Aunt Mary, my mum's elder sister, who's my godmother, she asked us to go and live with her in a little village called Wibbenbury. She was already evacuated there. Relatives from Liverpool came to see us. And whenever they came, we always had a party and dancing. And I always used to get dragged up to sing the old rustic bridge. I sang it once from a grandma and she never let me forget it. So I always had to get up and sing that. And my cousin Jerry and I used to do the Andrew Sisters between us, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was great fun. We had lovely parties. Well, I remember my dad took me on his shoulders when I was nearly two to go into town to watch Dixie Dean coming home with the FA Cup. Later on, when I was a teenager, I watched him playing football on some waste ground in Netherton. He was retired many years. The old retired Everton players were playing against the old retired Liverpool players. After the match, he came round talking to all of us, and when he came to me, I told him that I went on my dad's shoulders to watch him coming home with the FA Cup and he was made up. So we had a nice little chat and well that's a memory that always sticks in there because I'm a dyed in the wool, true blue Evertonian. <laughs> I have one brother, I had one brother, sadly he died about six years ago. My brother Albert, he was two and a half years younger than me. Well, Albert was a very clever boy. He got all the brains of the family. The scholarship it was an exam you took when you were 11. If you passed a certain standard, and the higher the standard, better choice you had for a school. And Albert, he just sailed through all that. Later on, he got called up on national service when I think he was 17. He chose to go in the Air Force. He was only there a short time, and they'd seen his CV and what he was worked for, and they said, would you like to do the Russian course? And he said, yes, I'd love that. At school, he was very good at Greek, Latin, French. He came top in all those subjects and at college as well, you know. So he was tailor-made for the uh, Russian course. So he was a Russian, a Russian translator. I know when we went on holidays, my cousin Jerry and I, she's my favorite cousin and my best friend, still is. If Albert said, I think I'll come along with you, we were made up because no matter what country we went to, he could speak the language. There were languages he knew fluently, and even though he didn't know, he was very soon to pick up on the things he needed for the holiday. I didn't mind what I did for work as long as I could dance. I love dancing. I go dancing quite a lot. I used to dance in the street. You see, my mum couldn't afford to send me for dancing lessons, but Rona, a friend from across the road, they were more well off than us. When she came home from the lessons, she used to teach me, and the two of us used to tap dance in the street and give little, little concerts to the neighbours. <laughs> I used to love to dance with someone who could really dance, but I danced with anybody. My dad sadly died. Uh, when he was only 46, and I was 13 and a half. And he worked in the metal box. The personnel officer came to the funeral, and she said to my mum, when Eileen leaves school, bring her along to me, and I will give her a job. As soon as I was 14, I left school on the Wednesday, went for the job on the Thursday. She told me to come back on the next day, Friday, for a medical. And I started work on the Monday. 
So uh, I worked as a little office girl. I used to do the postage and the stamps. And I went for lessons in shorthand and typing, which one of our priests paid for. Actually, I didn't um, use the shorthand in my job. But what I did use it for was taking down all the words of the pop songs on the radio. <laughs> so it became useful in my own way. And I used to relieve on the switchboard. We had a blind man on the switchboard and he taught me how to use it. And I used to have to go out to the post office for new stamps and all that sort of thing. One of the ladies used to lend me her bike to cycle to the post office and come back again. I did all that. I worked in the metal box for 19 and a half years. The Ainsley Institute, we used to uh, hire it. When we did plays, we used our own hall. But when it was a big show, we had the Ainsley Institute. And then eventually, Father Oldsby bought it, and we had lots of shows, and our club moved downstairs. The Beatles used to go there for their rehearsals, too. They were only young and that, you know. We didn't actually mix with them or speak with them, but sometimes they were just coming out as uh, we were going in, you know, and I used to go up the stairs to get to the back of the stage, and I think I was going up the stairs, and one of them came down. I think I was too frightened to say, hello, George. Well, it was at the Amateur Dramatic Society in the Blessed Sacrament. I knew him for a very long time before I ever went out with him. Never even considered him as a boyfriend. Frank, or Hector as I knew him at the time, in two of the plays he played my father. He was my father in a play called White Sheep of the Family, and he was the chief of police. And I was his wayward daughter, who used to go around robbing safes for excitement. And of course, I knew I couldn't take the loot home because my father was the chief of police. So I used to post it back to the people I'd stolen it from the next day. And this was puzzling the criminal world. You know, I said, who is this person, you know? Another one, he was a politician, he used to get up on the soapbox and give it everything, you know, and always saying how he was for the humble man and he'd do this and he'd do that. He supported black people. And then I came home with my boyfriend and he was black. Well, that changed my father's views. He proved to be racist. And he and I had this fearful row on the street, on the stage, arguing and arguing and arguing. And some of my friends were in the audience. They said, we were terrified with biting on her. We thought that you were going to start fighting. She said, we, we thought either he'd hit you or you'd hit him. It was furious the way we were going at each other. Every, everyone in the audience was expecting us to lash out at each other. <laughs> it was that serious. But at this time, there was no connection about boyfriends at all in any of this time. It was quite a long time later when he uh, approached me and asked me if I'd uh, I to go out with him. And I was not sure at all. I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Well, I can't go on Monday because I've got night school. I can't go on Tuesday because something else. And I had an excuse for every day. I said, um, I'll see you at the show show next Sunday. Oh, right. And we did this for a couple of weeks and I was running out of excuses. <laughs> I was just scared to start going out with him because I wasn't sure that I liked him that much. Oh, I just... I hit my leg, I had the cartridge out, and he was saying, can I see you on Wednesday? I said, oh no, not on Wednesday, no. I said, I'm going to the hospital. He said, so you're not working on Wednesday? I said, no. He said, well, I'll meet you coming out of the hospital. And I went home to my mum and said, I couldn't get out of it, mum. <laughs> he worked in the co-op at the time. They always had Wednesday afternoon off. So he came to meet me and we went into town and we went to the Gorman Cinema. After that, we went for a meal, and I said to him, have you got another name I could call you instead of Hector? I said, don't like Hector. <laughs> so he said, you call me Frank. I said, oh, that's much nicer. That's much nicer. He said, uh, yeah, he said, I was Frank in the army. I said, were you? He said, yes. I said, well, how was that? The war started in 39, I think 40. He'd, uh, it, he was called up. And he was only 18, and there were other blokes all called up like him, all 18-year-olds. They didn't know each other at all, but they all must have had to write the name and on forms and that and give them in. 
and the man came back with a whole stack of uniforms. The man called out the name, and the first uniform he picked up, he said, Frank Short. So he went up and got it. Well, all the other blokes heard him say Frank Short. They all started to talk to each other. Hey, Frank this and John that, you know. Now, Frank didn't say to them, my first name's Hector. He just accepted Frank. And he stayed Frank with the rest of the time. And he was so used to being called Frank. When he came home, his brother Bill, who was also called up a couple of years later, still in the war, he started calling him Frank. So I said, well, how is it I only know you as Hector? I said, I've known you for years in the Dramatic Society. Frank never argued with what anyone would say. If they called him Frank, he'd answer. If they called him Hector, he'd answer. He was at El Alamein. And uh, of course, that was, a, that, was the, that was the battle that turned the war over. Leading up to El Alamein, there was very little hope for England. But after Alamein, turned the other way and we began to win. It was a very fierce battle and he lost a lot of his friends. There were, he was on the 25 pounder guns. There were six of them. Four of them were killed. The only two that survived were your grandpa and his best friend. While they were uh, shooting, there was heavy fire and they were cowering down behind the gun. And he saw one of his friends sitting on the floor like that, the side, and he was calling him. He crawled on his knees and put his hands under the shoulders to drag him back. And as he put his hands around, his own hands came to his own chest. His friend had been blown right through the chest. He said, do you know what I got for my 21st birthday when I was at El, El, El Alamein? I said, what? He said, half a can of water. He said, and it was the best present I could have ever had because they hadn't eaten or drunk anything for three days. And this is the situation, he went through all of that. And then after that, he, he travelled up Italy and he went to all the different places. I can't remember them all. Uh, Durban, I think, was one of them. And then when the war was over, he wasn't demobbed until 1947. So he was still in the army two years after the war had finished. And for those two years, he was transferred to Vienna. He used to drive a jeep with the uh, Austrian police, looking for, for the black marketeers and things like that, you know. Anyway, things were a lot calmer then. Your grandpa was very keen on classical music. He loved classical music. And he was a good singer himself. He sometimes sang in our church. And he had a friend, a close friend in the army, it was like him, they both loved classical music. When the, the tickets would come in for the classical music, there was no raffles to see who got them. Frank and this bloke got the tickets and they used to go to all the uh, classical music concerts. All the others, they didn't even volunteer for that because it gave all the others a chance to go to those dancing girls and all that kind of thing. One of the uh, opera singers, um, God Siegfried, your grandpa had a real crush on her. She lived in Vienna. Frank and his mate knew where she lived and they were showing off to their mates that they were uh, going to take her for a, a run in their jeep through the Viennese woods. They were just telling fibs like, showing off. Mate said, right, well, we're going to come and see you. They said to him, what are we going to do? They went there and the, the, the other jeep was several yards behind them, but watching. They knocked at the door and the butler did answer. And they said, we're fans of Herb God Siegfried and we'd love to have an autograph. He said, oh, come in. So they looked at each other and went, <coughs> She's upstairs, I'll give her a call. And the butler went and spoke to her. Anyway, she came down and she came in. Both of them were gobsmacked, you know. <laughs> Who are you? So they gave her the names and said, you know, in the army. And they'd been to several concerts. They said, um, we've got um, some of our colleagues down there waiting for us to come out. They didn't believe that we'd have the courage to come here. So she said, well, what did you tell them you were going to do? So they said, Oh, you'll have to forgive us, but we told them that we were going to take you through for a ride through the Venus woods. She said, hang on, I'll get me coat. So she got a coat and they all went out 
and climbed in the jeep and shot off to the Viennese woods, leaving all these fellows gobsmacked, you know. <laughs> they became quite friendly and uh, she gave Frank and his mate a photo of herself, which they tr he treasured, he had it in his pocket for years. Every time there was a show, either she or her husband used to uh, send them tickets. So they got tickets from um, God and their uh, husband for all these years they were there. When we started going out, he told me all this and he showed me the picture. I said, oh, she's lovely, you know, very nice. They had it in his pocket. Anyway, shortly after we were married, I was going through the drawer and, and I found this picture. I said, Frank, what's this picture doing in the drawer? I thought you always kept it in your pocket. He said, well, I did. He said, but when we got engaged, I felt it wasn't the right thing to do. So he took it out of his pocket and put it in the drawer. I said, don't be daft. So I fished around for another drawer and got a, a photo frame. So I stuck this picture in the photo frame and stuck it on the shelf. I said, she stays there and because he was made up. He proposed to me on our second date. <laughs> second date. The second date was a week later, and we were on a boat, ferry boat, going over to New Brighton. And he proposed to me. Of course, I said no. He proposed to me every time we went out after that. About six weeks later, we went to New Brighton again. And this time, we went to the magazines, which is a little pub. Now, I don't know whether I had an extra gin and tonic or not, but I was feeling all gay and everything. When we came out, came down, a lot long path it was, to the prom. We were laughing and that, you know. He was joking with me and I was in a happy mood. He proposed to me again at the prom. And I went, um, um, he said, yes, yes. I was like, um, all right, yes. <laughs> And he went, yippee! So he picked me up and swung me round. And people passing by were looking like that. And he said, she's going to marry me. And they were going, oh, congratulations. Oh, Catherine. He was saying to all passers by going along the prom. And he got hold of me and danced me up and down the prom. <laughs> of course, he wanted to get married right away. It did in a couple of months' time. I went, oh, no, no, no. <gasps> I'd be sobered up a bit by then. No, no, far too soon. Next year, maybe. So it was 15, 15 months later that we actually got married. Oh, at Harp, our church, Blessed Sacrament. When we got married, he thought he'd try and get a better paid job. So he went to the English Electric, which is GEC, you know. He got a job in the factory. In the first week, he slipped and hurt his leg. And he was off work for eight weeks. My mum said to me, if you want to get a job, I will pick Francis up from school at 12 o'clock, take him home, feed him, and take him back. That's a good idea. So I immediately rang Gyro, and I said, any chance of a job? They said, can you come tomorrow for an interview? I said, yes. I went for the interview, and they said, can you start on Monday? I said, yes. Can you work overtime? I went, yes. Your granddad wasn't a great cook. You know, he could make himself a cheese sandwich or something, but he couldn't cook. But my mum was a very good cook, and she came to our house and cooked us a meal, you know. She did everything like to make me able to go to work. I earned more money in the first three weeks I was there than I'd ever had in my life. I was intending to stay there until we got on our feet, but I was earning so much money. Your granddad had to go to the doctor for um, a checkup and they discovered he'd had glaucoma and was losing his sight. I decided to stay at Gyra Bank and accepting my mum's generosity. And eventually, Francis grew old enough to be able to make his own way home. Your granddad worked for as long as he could, but his sight was getting that bad. I asked him to get early retirement, which he did. So I worked in Gyra Bank for 21 years, 19 and a half at the metal box, 21 years in Gyra Bank, you know, clerical work and everything. But, uh, you know, I was there for all those years, until I was 60.
I think I'm well entitled to my state pension. <laughs> Fondest memory. Oh, I think when my son was born, I had my one and only lovely baby boy. <laughs> I felt elated on cloud nine. And of course, there's been other lovely moments, but I don't think anything could beat that. Well, it was just the best thing that ever happened to me in my life, and I was enormously happy. I would have loved a big family, but it wasn't God's will. So I just had to make the most of that. <laughs> Francis John Carmel. He's never forgiven me for putting Carmel in his name. But the thing is, I had a great respect and a love of Cardinal Heenan. He was a lovely man. His name was John Carmel Heenan, you see. That's why I called you dad, Francis John Carmel. When he went to school, he was very good. Your dad was excellent at sport. I suppose you know that. He was in the rugby team, the swimming team. He used to swim for the school. He was the athletics captain. He made a record jump in triple jump, which a few years ago I was at the school looking at him and his name, several years later, was still there. Nobody had ever broken his record at 12 years of age. The lads were all going to uh, rugby practice and they all stopped to read this notice on the door and everybody's name in the school were printed on this page. They started look, looking for their own names, you know. And then they saw, they said, hey, hey, look at this. Francis John Carmel, oh, wait till he comes out. So when he came out, they were all saying, Carmel, are you, uh, are you coming to rugby practice today, Carmel? He stood there and he said, I'm going to kill my mother when I get home. <laughs> he, he never uses it, he just says, FJ Short. But if you get his birth certificate out, you'll see it's Francis John Carble. <laughs> I, when he, I met Verena, I thought, what a lovely, lovely girl she was. I immediately thought she was lovely. And uh, when they got married, well, I was, I was just happy. Your dad hated cabbage when he was a baby. And I was telling him how good it was and how it would do him good, but he wouldn't have it. I told him a story about when he was in my tummy, he just found out where babies came from. When I had my dinner, I said, eat a roast potato, and it'd go right down the tube, and you'd be sitting there at the bottom and eat it all up. And he was excited listening to this. I said, and then I'd have some meat, and that would go down, eat it all up. And then I ate my cabbage, and his little face dropped. And I ate all the cabbage, and you ate it all up. Well, he wasn't a bit impressed with that story at all. So the following night, he said, can I tell you a story? I said, OK, what is it? When I was in your tummy, you used to eat the roast potato, and it'd come down, and I'd eat it all up. And then, and stop for a little giggle, and then, hoo, hoo, hoo. He said, when you had the cabbage, it came down the tube. He said, you thought I ate it all up. He said, but I didn't. I just shoved it on one side. <laughs> You were born and your granddad and I went down, of course, to see you all. You were put just on the end of the couch and uh, Elliot was running round and round and round and he was getting kept occupied. But he was given a cup with sweets in. When he passed us, I'd say, Elliot, I said, who's that pointing at you? And he'd say, I don't know. Who's that next to you, Elliot? I don't know. And I said, it's Oscar! And he went, Oscar! And ran round and round. And a bit later on I say, who did you say that was? I don't know. Your mum said to Elliot, would you like to stroke his tummy? And he got his index finger out and he went, <laughs> I would love to see more of you, but I know you're two busy young men and you've got your studies on. I don't want you to miss up on any of them. I just want you to live your lives, be happy, do all the things you want to do. And if ever you have the time to come to Liverpool and see me, I'd be over the moon. And uh, yeah, I, I just love being with you. <laughs> I have no favourites. The both of you are like peas in a pod and I love you both to bits. I'm delighted that you, as brothers, you get on so well. And you do, and that really thrills me. And I just hope and pray that you will always be like that. 
Even if you meet and marry girls and move away, I hope it won't break that bond that you've got between you. He died in, um, on the 23rd of February, 2004. Oh, we had a requiem mass, of course, you know. I, you know we always have that at funerals, requiem mass, and uh, there were lots of people there who knew him. Everyone in church knew him well because he was one of the readers and he was in the CYMS and he was in the Dramatic Society and uh, he was in so many things that uh, he was very well known and respected and everybody loved him. There were quite a few tears every time anyone spoke to me about it, you know. It was difficult but only like it is with everybody else, you know. I sort of coped and that was it. Well, I've been in sheltered now since the 7th of June, 2010. We have days out and uh, socials downstairs. As soon as the music starts, my feet start going. I cannot resist it. So I get up and have a little jig. They call me the dancer. Because <laughs> I'm always the first or second on the floor doing a dance. I, I just love dancing. I always have. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Oscar, Eileen's favourite grandson. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this life reel that I made for my grandma. She was quite a character. Um, I think sitting down and interviewing your loved ones is incredibly important. And if you'd like to learn how to make a life reel of your own, you can click the link in the description to my online course. In Life Reel Academy, I take you through all the steps of creating a life reel from conducting an interview with a loved one, setting up a camera, lighting your shot, video editing, scanning photographs, retouching and restoring those photographs using free, easy to use software, digitizing old home movies, finding background music and much more besides. I think interviewing your loved ones is one of the most important things that you can do and I highly, highly recommend it. If it sounds like something that you're interested in, the link is in the description. Uh, thank you, all the best.